the map of London in 1800. At that time, London was the largest city in the world. It was overcrowded and poor citizens were living surrounded by their own fields. When cholera broke through in Soho in 1854, it was believed that cholera was spreading by miasma in the air. One of its residents, Dr. Young Snow, decided to gather the location and map the location of the wells in Soho. He also mapped the location of all the known deaths caused by cholera. When he put these two streams of data together, he realized that there was a cluster of deaths around one of the wells. In this case, it was enough for Dr. Snow to gather and evaluate data in order to solve a problem. 200 years earlier, in London, in 1666, there was the Great Fire. For four days, the city of London was in flames. After the fire, the city was completely destroyed. And King Charles II decided to ask a series of architects and surveyors in order to present new proposals for the city. Five proposals were presented. All of them had better provision of green infrastructure, better road network, and better lighting conditions for the dwellings. But at the end, none of them went through. The city was rebuilt exactly the same way. Why? They had data. They knew the land ownership. They also had evidence of the benefits of the new solutions. But this time, it was not enough. Because the landowners didn't have any instrument to negotiate and to agree to a common ground. In urban design, you have parameters. Parameters belong to a particular system that everybody agrees. Parameters, such as decibels, can help us to assess noise pollution. But you also have values. Values are what is worth for someone. In urban design, different communities and individuals might value the space differently. This problem still persists nowadays. And despite we have new technologies to capture much more sophisticated data, we are still in the same problem. For example, this image is built with satellite data. It can help us to understand the status of coastal ecosystems. We also have activism mapping. Citizens can today generate their own data and upload it into the internet. Or we can sense live the cities. Technology like this um, monitoring a station of pollution. But despite all this technology, if we look at the report from UNN Habitat in 2016, which is the United Nations Program for Urban Development, it clearly says that our urbanization model is unsustainable. It consumes too much land and is energy intensive. And this is because in our current urbanization model, there are no instruments that measure individual values against the common interest. So I wanted to tap into this problem. And I found that the urban design practice relational urbanism. Relational refers to the way in which two or more things or people come together. Relational urban models are interactive design toolkits, interface platforms that aim to share evidence on the design, but they remain open. So they serve as a catalyst for negotiation and the creation of shared values. I'm going to give you a series of examples. Back to China in 2013, we worked on the urban issue of the urban villages. Urban villages are fragments of the city that result from rural to urban migration. Some are very unhealthy. 
but some fragments are very life and they are very nice. But what is more important is that they are all scattered across the city and they host low-paid workers, immigrants, students in the city. The trend at that time was to demolish the urban villages, relocate this population in the outskirts of the city, creating inequalities, increasing insecurity, and making all these people to commute to work for long hours. Local NGOs and universities were trying to challenge this model, but it never got accepted under the grounds that it was not economically viable. So we wanted to help them to try to challenge this argument. And we built the first relational urban model. The relational urban model was a platform in which you could input demolition scenarios so we could defend partial demolition, partial regeneration of urban villages, and we could input also urban blocks and land use distribution. And we had output the cost-benefit analysis and the urban population mix. If in a, a traditional architectural practice, they will do three to four options, we were able to develop 16 iterations in which we prove that some of the options of partial demolition were economically valuable. In this case, the relational urban model helped us to assess the individual value of the business developer against a common interest and try to find a common ground that is more fair for all. The next example I'm going to talk about is a completely different scenario. In this case, we use the relational urban model to try to approach to the local communities and try to understand what was the nature of the problem. We work in this project in South Dublin. The context is a park that has a strong problems of antisocial behavior and street drinking. There was a local group of skaters and BMX riders who tried to advocate for the generation of a skate park. But despite efforts from the Irish Architectural Foundation and Dublin City Council to build community engagement, the local community opposed to the project. So we wanted to generate something positive with, with this conflict. And the first thing we did was to engage the local community, the young people, into the design. We built this toolkit that was constituted by a sandbox where the children and the skaters could model and could explain what they wanted the park to be. Then it was captured by a Kinect and a projector. At the beginning, they were a bit reluctant, especially the skaters. But then I was transparent. They did it themselves. They did my job, actually. <laughs> so the other part of the community who didn't want the project was basically because they didn't want the their park to be turned into concrete. So we convinced the local skate uh, stakeholders that if the skaters were going to have a skate park, they should have a beautiful garden. So with the earthworks we used to extract to generate the skate balls, we developed a series of grass mounds where we could integrate a playground for all and a garden. I believe, as a designer and educator, that everybody in its own way designs. We design the way we look, and we give meanings to things. It, this is the way we build our identity, by sharing the design with the local uh, skaters and children. We build the identity of the place together. And doing so, I esteem a sense of belonging and a capacity for cooperation. In the last project I'm going to talk about, we try to use the relational model 
to engage the community about urgent environmental issues in the site and try to promote an urban model that was more according to the logics of the environment. Three months ago, I was approached by a colleague from the Architectural Association in London. He's also one of the owners of one of the oldest architectural firms in Nazareth, in the Middle East. I remember one of the first things he told me was, in my homeland, in 60 years, it's going to be so hot that nobody will be able to live there anymore. So we worked together in this development in the coast of the Sea of Galilee. When we did the first research, we learned that actually the sea is drying up and that it's getting more and more polluted due to the excess of nutrients. Our first idea about the project was to propose a system of ecology where we could take out the water and run the water through our site so it gets oxygenated and it, it helps to clean the, the lake. But when we used the model to assess our site, we realized that actually the, all the morphology of the ground was compromised. So we couldn't run the water by gravity. We convinced the local stakeholders to recover the identity of the crown and to try to implement a new ecology that will help the lake to perform better. Ten days ago, we were communicated that we got the project. And for me, this has a much bigger meaning. It means that there is still out there people no matter where they come from, from different communities, that they are willing to come together to make a better planet. Cities are currently designed mainly following private interests. We need instruments and tools that are able to measure individual values against the common interest. This is my commitment as an architect, designer, researcher, and educator. I believe we need to lead future generations in that direction, with entrepreneurship, creativity, and imagination. And maybe in the future, we can garden pollution, or we can launch our backyard to generate more fresh food for all. I believe we need to teach designers and architects to use technology and evidence in support of their design, but they should open it up to the people, listen to the people and design with humanity and compassion. The way I do it is by using my relational urban models, which are nothing more than connecting people with environment and people with people the environment and the values from other communities need to be part of our own ethos, our own shared identity as humanity. Thank you. <laughs>